Good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, we appreciate uh, all of you being in community here with us to, to support John. So, so welcome to, uh, to his uh, dissertation defense. Uh, first of all, I just want to shout out to send a shout out to the committee for, for their involved work. Um, they worked hard in terms of facilitating the sound study, as you'll find out, um, for, for John's uh, research. So uh, really thankful. I know, you know, once again, there's a busy time for all of us. So appreciate uh, taking the time. Uh, in terms of uh, the process here, I have asked John to engage uh, all of us uh, in covering his, his topic to, to take about the, I would say 30 minutes uh, to, to hit us on the, to hit the, the key points, particularly as it relates to chapter four and five, since the dissertation proposal uh, covered the first three chapters. So 30 minutes of, of presentation on his part. <clears throat> then I would say another 30 minutes or so of the committee debriefing. This is the fun part where we get to, to probe, you know, ask questions and uh, he'll get to truly defend his, his study, right? That's, that's what we're here for, for him to defend his, his dissertation. Um, and then we'll, the committee will get a chance to, to convene in a breakout room and debrief. Then we'll come back and, and uh, give, uh, give him our, our verdict. So in terms of process, that's what it, it will entail. Um, actually, j just a, a side note, uh, um, you know, John has already actually ventured uh, his study and presenting it beyond kind of a dissertation presentation. He, he was involved with the Sac State Grand Slam uh, competition. I, uh, I happened to join in and uh, very successful, very successful. The challenge for him that he had to present his, his study in three minutes. Uh, so uh, I, I can tell you, he, he uh, in his background, he, there's some theater uh, experience because uh, he did a good job. It was very, very successful. Uh, so congratulations to him. And, and, and that's the expectation of our doctoral students to take it on the road beyond the, the, the dissertation format structure and and uh, engage in presentations, engage in, uh, in, in research in terms of uh, publications, writing, definitely. So uh, he's already started that. So continue with that journey there, John. Uh, okay, John, all yours, go for it. Oh, well, it is an honor. I, I just want to first of all say thank you. There are so many people in the audience today. Uh, uh, my community is here. Uh, my, my, my amazing wife and my children are here, and that's an honor. So I have family surrounding me, family and friends, colleagues and coworkers, board members who have supported me along the way. I have former students in the audience, and so thank you to the audience. But I really got to, before we get started, thank the committee. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Navarro is our chair. Uh, really, without his guidance, uh, you know, this, this study would not have shaped into what it's become. And I'm very proud of the findings, and, and a lot of it has to do with the, the leadership of, of Dr. Navarro. So thank you. And obviously, uh, Dr. Jude, not us, uh, Dr. Rivas, and, and Dr. Oselic, thank you. Each one of you uh, has a has an imprint on this study that I'll talk about on the next slide. Now, Dr. Navarro has said that uh, you know I get 30 minutes, and then then the hook comes out. And I'm gonna get pulled off stage. So uh, if I if we could hold all questions to the end, that'd be great. I'm gonna start my timer right now. Okay, I have 30 minutes. You know, this first slide uh, indicates that back on January 21st of 2021 was our proposal defense. We went through the first three chapters of the dissertation, and the committee gave some amazing feedback that really shaped the study. And I'd like to acknowledge that feedback with the committee. First of all, the committee uh, uh, indicated that I should infuse the concept of efficacy. So we went in and changed research question one, and then included the new general self-efficacy scale uh, by Chen, Gully, and Eden, and that really produced some interesting findings in chapter uh, uh, five. Um, the, the committee also uh, advised that I seek out roadblocks to climate preparation, which this was added to the qualitative protocol. And as you know, I mean, really shapes a lot of the findings in the framework that I produce at the end of this uh, dissertation. And then prepare for equity as an emergent finding. Uh, added a a, um, a uh, composite to the uh, to the survey around this, as well as a. a, a interview protocol question. So really uh, wonderful sh shapings to this study. So thank you to the committee for that. 
I'll go back to chapter one. I'll do chapters one through three in five minutes, and then we'll spend the rest of the time together on results and findings. Uh, so uh, chapter one, the purpose of the study was to examine the role of the leader uh, right, in preparing a school climate for disruptive change. And for, for, for that, we need some definitions. School climate is defined by Ostroff as the shared meaning or shared perception of staff members uh, given uh, uh, in regards to any organizational structure, policy, uh, process, procedure, routine. And, and um, uh, uh, Christensen defines disruptive change as requiring a, a paradigmatic shift or, or a mindset shift on the part of the organizational members that's irreversible. Like once we make this change, we are not going back. Uh, an example is, think back 25 years ago, no one in elementary ed education had heard the term active shooter drill. And sadly, over 25 years, we've gone through the slow disruptive change process to the point where we now have adopted a new paradigm that indicates, well, these are the normal procedures to um, uh, creating safety on our elementary school campuses. So there's an example of disruptive change. Now, Carter and White have a fascinating set of studies that, that indicate that disruptive change is escalating in the modern era to the point where it, disruptive change is happening not just one disruption at a time, but they have what they call stacking disruptions, where one disruptive change is influencing the work of, school client, uh, of a school leader and another change has begun. The, the problem that I'm trying to attack here is I believe that too little is known about preparing a school climate during this era of increasing disruptive change across the K-12 setting. Now, here's some examples of disruptive change. And imagine yourself as a leader in a school setting. Um, COVID-19 hits and we're dealing with disruptive change and how to shift to distance learning. Then in the summer of 2020, after the uh, horrific death of George Floyd, the demands for social justice through civil unrest create another disruptive change. Then the budget crisis. Uh, stacking disruptive changes uh, are, are really across these uh, setting during the 2020-2021 school year. So it was a fascinating time to talk to leaders and ask them how they prepare a climate for these imminent disruptive changes. So the research questions that guide this study were first, to what degree do leaders perceive that they have the efficacy to influence climate? Second is kind of a method study. Like um, which of the five identified school climate factors do leaders value in preparation for disruptive change? So um, uh, when these are present, do, do they help prepare a school climate. Uh, and we asked the leaders, what about investing in flexibility to innovate, offering staff the flexibility to innovate? Does that help prepare a climate? Shared decision making, uh, uh, investing in capacity building and professional learning, uh, or utilizing mission aligned communications and mental models, or investing in a shared sense of value and appreciation. When these are present, do they assist uh, with climate preparation? Now, each of these five climate factors were curated from the climate preparation literature, but they've never been assembled together in one study and applied to K-12 education and preparing a school climate for disruptive change. So I think that's some interesting contributions to the literature that come from the study here. And the last question is, to what extent are school leaders engaging in climate preparation for disruptive change? Maybe they're not. Uh, when we wrote this question, we didn't know. Maybe leaders were just thinking about today and not preparing for tomorrow. The initial conceptual framework were kind of the guardrails of like, okay, it's these concepts that we're going to stay focused on. Don't get distracted. Stay on these concepts. And the concepts that what we utilized were um, disruptive change, uh, school climate, leadership, school uh, or organizational structure, and organizational culture. But the theoretical underpinnings, the key major theories that we utilized really played out for this study. First, Lewin's 1951 change process theory, where we think about change as a process, which is important because in step one of the process, Lewin proposes that climate preparation is part of the process. So this theory held up very well in the study. And then motivated sociocognitive climate theory. Uh, this is really useful because uh, it, it, it talks about how climate emerges within an organization. That uh, when school staff have a uh, uncertainty around a potential policy, then that uncertainty can be replaced with shared meaning, and that's the emergence of climate. And that shared meaning is crafted through these symbolic social interactions. And what we'll hear, hear the leaders say is that every interaction is an opportunity to create a symbolic social interaction, helping to craft shared meaning and, and, and merge climate. So uh, both theories held up very well. 
Now I can do an hour on the lit review. I'll do one minute. Uh, three key findings in the literature, and they were this. School climate matters. Uh, it's, it's critical to engaging in change. And also that uh, planned change, emergent change, disruptive change, they're all these theories include, uh, they're all processes, and those processes all include climate preparation. So we're kind of tying together the literature. Uh, climate matters. Climate preparation is part of change. And the last key factor is that leadership is a, plays a critical role in preparing for and managing change. So looking back to that purpose, the purpose of the study is to examine the role of the leader in preparing a school climate for disruptive change. So the literature supports it. And I think there are some contributions from this study to the literature. So how did we go about uh, uh, studying this, uh, this topic? Uh, it was a uh, concurrent triangulation mixed methods. What does that mean? Uh, there are two different types of data, quantitative data and qualitative data. The quantitative data is uh, uh, when people submit a survey using Likert scale multiple choice questions. And the qualitative data is through interviews, but also through narrative responses that were placed as optional questions inside the survey. We're going to collect all that concurrently, which we did, and then analyze the quantitative and qualitative separately at first, then uh, triangulate and um, uh, compare and interpret. And, and this is the methods by which I did that. Uh, I had a lot of fun in the quantitative analysis, doing descriptive statistical analysis, mean mode, uh, frequency, comparing how people answered uh, or groups answered particular questions. But I also had an opportunity to do composite score analysis. Uh, for efficacy, there was eight questions. But for flexibility to innovate, there's only three questions. So creating a composite so those could be compared was important, but with eight questions versus three questions, there wasn't equal statistical power. But by averaging the composites, now it's comparable, and all of the uh, uh, results for composite analysis were based on, on the averages. Uh, I was able then to use those composites in a multivariate linear regression analysis, which was a ton of fun. Uh, and then I got uh, a chance to analyze the qualitative uh, analysis um, uh, through open coding and theme generation. So what did we find out? Well, first, we had to talk to the leaders who showed up. We wanted a representative sample. Remember, our population is all California school and district leaders, and there's a lot of them, and we wanted to represent them well. So uh, sent out some emails. They had 11,137 emails land in inboxes across the state of California. I did some targeted posting on Facebook and the Twitters, and uh, this is what we came up with. I was hoping for 300 survey responses, really hoping for that magic number 300, and we ended up with 768 survey responses, which was phenomenal. I'm very grateful to all the people that participated in the survey. Now, not to get overzealous, I, I, I had to get rid of 161 of them because they, the surveys were incomplete, and I thought it was okay to discard them because it still left 607 surveys. That is a ton of data with 49 questions. That equals 29,743 Likert scale data points, and I had 870 narrative uh, codes placed in, so tons of data. Maybe it was too much data. Lots of data, and it was great. Um, now, I still had to do some interviews, which I'm very excited about. I asked the survey participants, hey, thanks for doing my survey. You want to be interviewed? Hundreds of people said yes. So I recruited 12 interview participants, conducted those interviews, and ended up with 141 pages of transcripts to an uh, analyze. And again, lots of data, tons of fun. Uh, I wanted to make sure that the sample was representative of the population. And so you can see in, in uh, several of these demographic charts, we have more principals than superintendents. That kind of lines up with the state. But race and ethnicity lines up very well. You can see the blue line is, um, is the sample and the red lines are the population. And uh, they're very close. Slight overrepresentation of white leaders, uh, slight underrepresentation of Latinx, Hispanic leaders, but very closely aligned there. A little gender gap, 7% overrepresentation uh, for male uh, participants, maybe a limitation in the study. But even the percent of students of poverty that are served very closely matches the, the uh, distribution of the whole state of California. So I felt very good about that. Now, when I curated the interview participants, I was very purposeful because uh, I knew that I was slightly overrepresented in white leaders on the survey. And so we um, purposefully overrepresented non-white leaders in the interview uh, uh, sample. One limitation though, no Asian leaders uh, in the interview uh, population, which or the interview sample, which I would definitely call a limitation. Luckily, we had 80 uh, narrative comments placed in the survey from Asian leaders, uh, but none interviewed, so I would like to call that limitation out. Now, I was looking for a diverse 
group of leaders, but there's other types of diversity. Look at the diversity in the size of organizations that these people run. There were some principals I talked to that have 101 kids, right? A little tiny principal uh, school. There were other leaders, uh, superintendents with 45,000 students. So really a diverse grouping of leaders uh, that really, really led to some, uh, some interesting findings. So let's dive in. What did we find out? Research question one, to what degree do leaders perceive they have the efficacy, the ability, right, to influence school climate? Well, quantitatively, we used the new general self-efficacy survey by Chan, and we, and we altered it uh, to target leader efficacy for influencing school climate. Okay, check. Had no idea what they're going to come back with. One being, I don't have any efficacy. Five being complete and total efficacy, scale of one to five. Here were the results. All together as a composite, leaders across the state of California, 607 representative uh, sample uh, at a 4.3 overall efficacy. That, that's, that, that was much higher than I had assumed. 81.5% uh, of the uh, participants scored uh, their composite of all eight questions in a four or five range. I mean, that is a, that is a uh, left skewed steep uh, uh, histogram and shows that very few people scored a one or two, and most scored a four or five. So quantitatively, we can answer the question, okay, check, we believe that California school district leaders have high efficacy for influencing school climate. And by the quantitative data, we might think, well, maybe influencing school climate is not that challenging. And that's why we do a mixed methods. That's why we ask people to be part of an interview. Because with 267 interview narrative responses and 12 interviews, uh, we came up with four emergent themes. I don't have time today to go deep dive into all of them but I will touch on a couple of them. Uh, uh, certainly, they have a positive perception. Check. But they did admit that there were challenges. There were barriers, legitimate barriers, and they weren't budgetary or structural. They were mostly relational. Most of the barriers to preparing climate is this human-on-human -human, uh, situation. So I want to key in on what the leaders told me was the way that they overcome these barriers. Number one, relationships. That investing in relationships powers the uh, leader's efficacy for um, influencing school climate. Let's listen to this superintendent and talking about his journey. After spending 18 to 20 years in a hostile type of environment, when I got the position of assistant superintendent, then superintendent, I was just done fighting. I was done. I was tired. I was like, you know, I can fight here for another 18 years or... I can change my mindset and work on building these work relationships. And I think that was the moment. And I think that was the moment that I realized that relationships power the ability to influence school climate. So that's a, I love that quote and it couples well because this, the theme of relationships had 70 quotes. I just picked one, but this sub theme of trust had almost as many uh, uh, quotes. This sub theme of creating trust and belonging, uh, listen to this quote. I've been engaged in creating trust in the organization for years. And when the pandemic hit, it has really paid off. Listen to the transactional nature of that quote. For years, I've been investing. Investing what? Investing trust. And then what happened? When the pandemic hit, when disruptive change came along, it paid off. Here we have this really nice uh, uh, example of how trust and relationships are the way we overcome barriers. But there's one more piece of this quote that ties into the next sub-theme, and that is time. Over and over, leaders told me this is not something that's measured in weeks or days or months. This is work over years. Leaders told me, I've been at it for three years. I've been at it for five years. And when the pandemic hit, whew, I was so glad I invested in trust and relationships. I also heard several leaders say, I just got my job. I was a brand new principal. Then the pandemic hit and the relationships weren't there and the trust wasn't there. And so really this factor, this, this combination of time, trust, and relationship matters. I just love this quote. So I added so, to answer your question, can I shape school climate? Not quickly. Just, it kind of sums it up. And there's a lot of quotes I could have pulled, but I love that one there. So, let's triangulate real quick. We have qualitative and quantitative data that indicate that leaders have a high efficacy for influencing school climate. Check. But we do have qualitative data that really contextualizes uh, the findings that says that there are barriers, but the relationships and trust and time help us to overcome those barriers. Research question two is more of a methods, right? We're going to look at the five climate factors curated from the climate preparation literature. And we're going to ask quantitatively, which of these do you value? And here we go. After 607 people responded across all uh, leader characteristics and institutional characteristics, 
incredibly high value for all five. Every one of them scores on a scale of one to five above a four. In fact, with 1,800 points of data per climate factor, they all score within a 0.2 of one another. Only two tenths of a point separated. The lowest one is a 4.3. The highest one is a 4.47. This data to me was fascinating. Uh, leaders value and leaders use these climate factors. But what's fascinating is what they told us here in the qualitative results or in the, in the qualitative uh, data. You know, over 771 pieces of, of coded data generated these five themes and seven sub themes. I will not talk to all these themes. We don't have that kind of time. I'm going to pull a couple of out to highlight. Uh, we'll start with flexibility to innovate because there's that word trust again. That second sub theme is trust staff as experts. And so you're going to see relationships and trust carry from research question one to research question two to research question three and make it into the framework in chapter five. Trust staff as experts. Let's see what this leader has to say. Flexibility to innovate is a matter of trust. And when you trust your staff, they trust you. When disruptive change happens, trust is essential among stakeholders. There's that, there's that transactional uh, experience again. When disruptive change happens, thank goodness I invested in trust. Well, what's one system or method for, uh, uh, for creating trust? The leaders say, by offering uh, flexibility to innovate, you are generating trust. And so what we're going to start to see in these climate factors is they don't act like unidirectional tools that I initially perceived them to be. Like I'm going to give you flexibility to innovate and now you're going to uh, you know, have a, a more change receptive climate. They act as systems that require inputs from leadership and staff. And when leadership and staff work together collaboratively, the outputs are things like relational trust, which we see in this. Here's another quick example. I won't add a quote to this one, but... Look at shared decision-making. Look at the two sub-themes. Leveraging shared decision-making teams. That's my leadership team, my grade-level teams, my department chair teams. As a leader, that's all about managing relationships. This whole theme here is about relationships, uh, both investing in relationships and relationships that come out of this little climate factor here. Also collaborating with key staff. Leaders said over and over again, I'm about to launch a big change initiative which are the key staff that I go to and say, hey, what do you think about this? It again is about managing relationships to help prepare a school climate for disruptive change. I'll jump to the last one, and that was a very strong theme that said, uh, you know, leaders value, creating a shared sense of value and appreciation. Staff need to know you value and care about them before they will listen to you. And there, there you go. Value and appreciation is a relational uh, uh, element. Uh, these relationships and trust matter. So again, quantitatively, uh, we have a triangulation between qu uh, quantitative and qualitative data that indicates uh, uh, leaders value and utilize all five climate factors. But the qualitative data really contextualize how these factors operate. Again, I'm starting to see them now as systems, not unidirectional tools. They require inputs of relationship and trust. They have outputs of relational trust and shared meaning making. And all of this starts to happen here in, in, uh, in research question two. Now research question three, to what extent are school leaders engaging in climate preparation for disruptive change? Uh, remember, we're going to use a multiple regression to determine if, if leader engagement in climate preparation for disruptive change um, is predicted by leader and organizational characteristics. And, and so our dependent variable is that engagement, that leader engagement. The way we built the composite for leader engagement, it's these questions. Uh, we asked leader, leaders, uh, I focus on preparing uh, a, a, a school climate uh, for disruptive change. I make significant efforts to prepare my school climate for disruptive change. I spend time thinking about how to prepare a school climate for disruptive change. This is the composite for engagement. Are you engaged in this work? And overwhelmingly, 90% uh, of the leaders scored a four or five on their composite. Uh, that is an extremely high number of leaders saying that they are engaged in this work regularly. 1% were uh, below a three. So we utilize this dependent variable, not a lot of variance, which I thought was going to affect the, the regression model because so many people, it's such a left skewed histogram. I thought, oh, there's not going to be a lot of variance, but we use that as our dependent variable. And here are the 11 independent variables or predictive uh, variables. And three of them come up as statistically significant, having a, a predictive relationship with the dependent variable. 
leader efficacy. When leader efficacy goes up, we can predict that leader engagement and climate preparation goes up. Use of the five climate factors. Now, not value in the five climate factors. Just valuing them wasn't enough. But those leaders who said, I use the five climate factors, were more likely to say they were, they were engaged in preparing school climate. And race, ethnicity presented as a statistically significant relationship that I'm going to unpack on the next uh, couple of slides that in a fascinating way. I'm, I'm in love with this little piece of data. Um, I ran the, the multiple regression. I ran the omnibus test. The model was significant, so we moved forward. Uh, immediately looked at the adjusted R squared and found a 0 0.367, which kind of indicates that 36.7% of the variance within the dependent variable can be explained by the 11 predictor uh, variables. So, uh, I, I, you know, it's a fairly powerful and strong, almost 40% then. Uh, and, and so let's look at the coefficients. Uh, with perfect significance, right, we've got the self-efficacy composite at 0.234, uh, meaning when self-efficacy composite goes up by one point, we can predict that the um, engagement in climate preparation is going to go up by 0.234. The strongest or uh, most powerful predictor here was use of climate factors. When use of climate factors went up by a point, we could predict that the engagement in school climate preparation goes up by 0.39 or almost 0.4 right there. Now, this is an interesting, just a, it's a 0.078 uh, impact, but we di dichotomized uh, ethnic, uh, ethnicity, race, ethnicity into white and non-white leaders and found a positive prediction uh, or a positive uh, 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 relationship between non-white leaders and um, uh, engagement in, in climate preparation, which I kind of went down a rabbit hole and started digging in the data and it started to become outside of the scope of the study. So I think it's going to make for a very interesting future research topic, but it was this, that um, um, I, our, our Latinx Hispanic uh, uh, leaders in the study had some outlier data uh, around shared decision making and shared um, sense of value and appreciation, which I think would make a really interesting future study around the topic of climate preparation. But uh, I'll, I'll try to stay within the guardrails here uh, and, and stay in, in research question three. So we did have some significant findings from the uh, multiple regression. And now the, um, the qualitative results, I'll just uh, touch on one, this idea that it is continuous and ongoing effort that makes this climate preparation happen. That uh, it's not a one and done uh, deal. It's, 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 it's every interaction, every conversation, every email you send, you are creating symbolic social interactions that create shared meaning and the emergence of school climate. Uh, listen to the one leader. I feel as though I'm doing this on a daily basis and through every interaction I have with my staff. So this idea that it's continuous and ongoing, it's not a, uh, it's not assigned to one particular, you know, part of your job. That it, this is your job. Uh, that came up repeatedly from leaders, and it really helped to shape the findings that we're going to present next. Uh, quick triangulation again in research question three. We have qualitative and quantitative data that indicates leaders are engaged in preparing school climate for disruptive change. The multiple regression helps to conceptualize some of the new framework in chapter five. And the qualitative data contextualizes how leaders engage. They engage through continuous and ongoing effort. So what do we find? Uh, those are the findings. Those are the results. Chapter five is like the, so what? Those are some nice coefficient tables. What does it mean? So I started from a place of, let's build a framework that explains how uh, we can now conceptualize uh, the preparation of a school climate for disruptive change, and it all starts with efficacy. When a leader feels efficacious, then they're going to engage, but there are barriers. And those barriers can be overcome with the in investment in relationships and trust. Okay, check, but how do we do that? How do we invest relationships and trust? Well, luckily, we have these five climate factors that now seem to work together as a system. In fact, people said, when you invest in flexibility to innovate, Aren't you also investing in shared decision-making? Isn't that offering people the opportunity to make decisions? Aren't you also showing a sense of value and appreciation when you offer the flexibility to innovate? So now we see these climate factors now working as a kind of a singular climate system where the factors are leaning on one another and strengthening one another. And what's interesting about these is each one seems to create symbolic social interactions that creates an output of relational trust through shared meaning making. So there we have uh, 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 the, the emergence of 
a prepared school climate. But what we also found was that this system, this climate system, strengthens when you have inputs of relationships and trust. So there we go. We got inputs of relationships and trust, which strengthens the output of relational trust, which then feeds back to efficacy, strengthening efficacy. The strengthened efficacy strengthens relationships of trust, which then strengthens the climate system, which then over a long continuous uh, period of time eventually creates a cyclical effect that strengthens that school climate in preparation for disruptive change. Now, uh, that's the model. These are the contributions to the literature, I believe, from the study that kind of line up with the model. We do have a strong indication that leaders hold efficacy for doing this work, that barriers exist, but relationships and trust help to mitigate those barriers, that, um, that uh, leaders uh, highly value and utilize uh, all five climate factors uh, across um, all settings, and that they strengthen through relationships and trust, and that, that these operationalize as a system with inputs from staff and uh, uh, leadership collaboratively to create these outputs of relational trust uh, and uh, the emergence of a school climate. Uh, they, they operationalize as a single system leaning on one another and, and, and over, over long periods of time while, while leaders are highly engaged in this work, uh, we, we see the system strengthening. The last piece is that we have a significant, uh, statistically significant relationships between efficacy, the climate factors, uh, the use of climate factors, and uh, the, uh, the engagement in preparing a school climate. So I told you about the conceptual model. Some of it's been revised based on the findings, right? Uh, originally, it was just leaders preparing the climate, but now we conceptualize it as uh, requiring input from staff and leadership. We also revised the climate emergence field. Uh, instead of just being a dotted line, everything takes place on top of this field now uh, because uh, all interactions are symbolic social interactions. And then we've reimagined school climate to expand and shrink uh, based on engagement in the system. Let's take a look at the new model here, and I'll kind of unpack it for you uh, one little piece at a time. Um, so this is the new model. You can see the system, the ongoing system in the middle. We'll, we'll take it from the top. Uh, this is the new climate emergence field based on motivated socio-cognitive climate theory. Everything that takes place on top of this field is symbolic social interaction. It's flanked by structures and organizational culture. And on this field is where our climate system is going to uh, continuously and ongoingly uh, work with inputs from leadership and staff to create this emergence of a school climate uh, that's prepared in the middle. Now eventually disruptive change is going to come along um, and it, it start the change process per Lewin. That's when structure and culture are going to place pressure on the system to slow down and pull apart, but through efficacy, relationships, and trust, that system is going to come back together and continue the change process to completion per Lewin's three-stage process there. So this is how we re reconceptualize uh, the model, staying with the original theories, but changing some of the elements uh, within. So just a couple of contributions uh, or recommendations for future research. Love to see some methods studied. To how do we overcome barriers to influencing school climate? Uh, how do we actually pragmatically engage in the climate use of the climate factors coupled with relationships and trust? And I'd love to see this study, a study of Latinx Hispanic leader engagement in climate preparation for disruptive change. I, I, I think there's a thing in there. Some recommendations for policy practice and, and leadership this is our last slide. Um, in the state of California, we have the California Professional Standards for Educational Leadership, and they conceptualize climate, uh, I feel, somewhat two-dimensionally, kind of as an element. I think it should, be re, it should rewrite the standards to include climate preparation as an ongoing uh, systematic approach. For practitioners, I think the development and distribution of pragmatic methods to leveraging climate factors coupled with relationships and, and trust uh, in, a, in kind of a systematic way to prepare school climate will be really beneficial. I think current practitioners and future leaders would benefit from that type of, uh, of uh, contribution. And for leadership, I think it's about the network. I think the leadership network has to perpetuate three things that climate preparation is being done across all settings, big schools, small schools, rich schools, poor schools. The work is being done across all settings. Um, the engagement in the climate factors emerges a school climate prepared for disruptive change. And so engaging in shared meaning making is what we should be talking about in the leadership network. And finally, climate, pre climate preparation is continuous and ongoing and measured over time. Leaders get tired, they get frustrated, they get burnt out. Um, they should know this this work takes years and years and years. So 
That was 30 minutes and 51 seconds. I'm 51 seconds over. I apologize. I will take any questions, comments, and opportunities for improvement. Thank you so much. Good work, uh, John. You stay within the 30 minutes. Don't worry. I think I, I took away some of your minutes. So all good. All good. <laughs> You covered quite a bit of uh, a lot of information, a very concise time. And for those that are interested and in, in get into the, the breadth and depth of the details of the construct that underscore his study, I'm sure he'll, he can make uh, his dissertation available to all of you. Uh, what uh, follows is now giving an opportunity for the committee to, to engage uh, John's presentation, to engage in terms of all the work he's done across the five chapters. Uh, in terms of moving forward, why don't we start with the first three chapters? And, uh, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, it'll be more of a cursory overview on our part, since uh, that was uh, what we covered in his dissertation proposal. Uh, so actually, on that point, let, let me, uh, let me start if that's all right with the committee. And, uh, and this would be more of a warm up uh, uh, question for you, uh, John. So, so based on your findings, do, do, your, do your study results support, refute, or add new climate factors that go beyond the five climate factors? And, and, I, and I ask you this, no, noting that you, know, you, you undertook a triangulation approach uh, to your study. Well, I think the contribution to the literature based on the climate factor study is that it is... Um, a new understanding of kind of the methods with which these climate factors are leveraged. Uh, you know, looking at the work of Norris or Christensen who pr produced some of these, uh, so, some of the climate factors come from their literature. Uh, th th there isn't this, um, this real coupling with um, the so uh, motivated socio-cognitive climate theory as a way to conceptualize how the work produces outputs of relational trust. So I think the contribution is really the understanding of the inputs and outputs of these climate factors. I also think the, um, the idea that the climate factors, which were curated from the literature from separate sources, are now being conceptualized as a unit that seem to work together, that seem to lean on one another. So I think the contribution in part is the, the curation of them now. Within the study, I do, I do mention in chapter five, there may be other climate factors that also, when added to these five, might also... Um, incorporate themselves in the system. I, an interesting uh, uh, consideration is like the use of data. If you were to appropriately use data in, uh, in decision-making paradigms as a sixth climate factor, might that help to perpetuate these relational um, outcomes uh, and, and shared meaning, which really is the emergence of climate? So uh, I, I'm not sure if that's the answer, uh, if that answers your question, but I, I do think that, that there is a contribution. However, I think there are more out there, I, 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 and I'm in search now. Yeah, and, and uh, just to follow up uh, to that, uh, could you call these five climate relationship climate factors? It seemed, as, as you were presenting, it seemed like if, if you were to consider a construct, a factor that underscore uh, the five climate factors, it was a sense of, of relationships. And I saw a little bit of relationship across those five climate factors, right? So it's almost like, it's overarching and underscores it, and it impacts it in multiple uh, directions. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I've been, as I've been, you know, the farther I got into the study, and I kept wanting to get away from the term climate factor, and I wanted to get toward climate system because they they really did operationalize as systems requiring inputs from leadership and staff, and that term relationship played in. But this this idea of each one of them is also a, a system for producing shared meaning. So I think shared meaning and relationship are, are maybe part of the conceptualization of, of the system itself. And, and, and part of the, it, it didn't seem like uh, any of those five climate factors were intentional or purposeful in actually noting relationships, more kind of in the periphery, right? Not directly. So I guess what I'm saying is from the qualitative perspective, uh, it seemed like relationships would be a key uh, factor to incorporate. So, uh, you know, just go back and make sure that 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 you you note that, particularly noting that I wouldn't be talking like this if it was a 
a purest quantitative approach. It is what it is, but since you did triangulation, then in that sense, you got to talk about how the, the qualitative impact the, the quantitative, the quantitative and vice versa, right? Agreed, agreed, yeah. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, the relationships piece did, was not present, but was found. It was, it right, was exactly. of, where a shared meaning was part of the initial yeah. model, relationships seem to come out of, uh, you know, yeah. not come out of nowhere, but came out of the data. Yeah, so go back to make sure it's saying in particular in your writings. Okay, let me give the uh, committee an opportunity to chime in. Dr. Rivas, Dr. Duganados, Dr. Oselic. A shy group here. Uh, I can. I have more questions here if you don't. <laughs> okay, maybe I can go ahead. Uh, first of all, John, I enjoyed reading your dissertation. Uh, and I especially like the way you triangulated. I was really curious how you were going to pull this through because those of you are, you know, are familiar with triangulation is this almost mythical <laughs> method, multi-method thing that we have always been taught about. Uh, and I've seen very rare published work on that, but I think you've taken a significant step and convinced me that, you know, triangulation can be possible because uh, it really added value to your findings. Uh, so I have um, a number of questions uh, spanning across the, the, the methods and then the theory and the practical implications of it. But I'm the most, the, 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 I'll start with the one that I'm the most curious about. Um, you got this significant high level of efficacy that really, you know, shine out from your data. So you've got this high level of efficacy among school administrators. And my question is, why so? And you cannot speculate the methods part. You can say that it's the methods, but it could be also the contextual factors or is it California factors? But why do we have this? Yeah. I, I, it's a really good question. Uh, first of all, utilizing that uh, that uh, new general self-efficacy uh, really added the reliability uh, and, and validity to, you know, because you and I didn't draft the questions. We, we stole those questions from a, a, a psychometrically validated uh, uh, instrument, which was helpful in saying that, oh, I think we have... Uh, some valid um, uh, responses here from the leaders. Why? It, and, and, and although why is somewhat outside of research question uh, one, uh, a little outside of the scope, I definitely would say a couple of things play here. Number one is we are talking about self-perception, which may be the least accurate perception. I think this is really interesting. I think this plays against uh, across all three research questions. We only asked leaders and we didn't ask you know, teachers or staff, hey, does that person seem like they're engaged in this type of work? So I think there's a limitation there that we uh, that we, we could definitely uh, uncover. Uh, I think qualitatively, though, the leaders demonstrated efficacy because they were passionate about uh, managing change. Leaders overwhelmingly said, it is so important for me, it's my responsibility to move things forward, especially in times of, of disruptive change management. And so because they felt so responsible for that work, that this was the work. I have this great quote I didn't include, but it's something to the effect of, this is the work. And leaders are saying, this is the work. And if I don't feel efficacious to influence climate, well, then what I'm saying is I can't do the work. I can't lead if I don't have the efficacy to influence climate. And so overwhelmingly, I heard leaders saying, Absolutely. This is the job of a leader. So I think the leaders, and maybe it was due to the protocol or the, or the survey instrument, um, uh, so potential limitations there, but overwhelmingly, leaders um, seem to couple efficacy with the responsibility of leadership. D does that make sense? Yeah. It does. And I think that deserves a nice paragraph in your discussion section because I don't think that these results are, are um, I mean, that might be method bias, common method bias, but given how strong these results are and looking at this special nature of the sample, which is, you know, education system, which is a tough environment uh, to make it to the top. I mean, you really have need to go through a lot of steps. So it's almost like a self-selection process. So when you are there, you build like sink or swim almost like you build your self-efficacy. So um, you might want to tie that a little bit to maybe to the education system, like what's special about these administrators 
in education system that makes them and take the results for granted. Like it looks like they're high. You have to be a high self-efficacy person uh, to be in that position, maybe. Uh, but why? So you might want to a little bit because I think that might have practical implications, uh, which might um, uh, which might be valuable. And related to that, and I will uh, maybe. Uh, uh, stay some uh, leave some of my questions for later because I, I will ask also uh, I would like other committee members to ask the, the composite scores and uh, this is a methods question so you combine the scores um, like one of them is uh, six items the other one is two items right so that you start uh, analyzing the data yeah. Uh, did you uh, check for the reliabilities of these composite items? You know, Dr. Junaj and I kind of talked about utilizing some Chromebox Alpha uh, uh, for reliability testing. We ended up not doing that uh, because we utilized averaging uh, in our composite uh, con uh, construct, uh, uh, hoping to create, you know, uh, uh, comparable statistical power through averaging rather than summation. But we did not. We did not run a Chromebox Alpha, but we discussed it uh, and, and considered it, uh, but decided that uh, the data was... Uh, uh, sufficient to, to, to move on without that. Yeah. So again, my recommendation would be if you want to put these analyses and results in your dissertation, and it's almost expected that, you know, those reliability scores are there so that those constructs make sense. Those items are actually can, can get together to mean something. So I would recommend that, you know, you do a quick analysis of this. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, yeah. we worked uh, collaboratively on that piece and uh, came to a different place than you did, but thank you. It's good feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Rebus, Dr. Duganados. Yeah, I have something that goes uh, fairly close to that. Um, and thank you for a fabulous presentation and a really good dissertation. Um, it, it was a joy to read and a joy to listen to. Um, very similar to uh, on, on the lines of the low efficacy and high efficacy, that, that percentage was so small of the folks that had low efficacy, I know in the quantitative data, but was there anybody present during those interview processes that illustrated any of the components that would be considered low efficacy? It's such a, it's such a great question, right? I, I thank you for asking. So, so I, you know, again, uh, I ran the data, I got the data and I, I started thinking, who are you? Who is this low efficacy? So I, you know, I kind of wandered down the rabbit hole of the SPSS and ran multiple like mean comparisons based on demographic subgroup and, and I just couldn't put my finger on. And I really thought it was going to relate to years of service. I really thought it was going to be people with less years of service, but I just didn't find. And because there wasn't, uh, there, was, there just wasn't enough variance in the data on the top end. So you get these really small outputs of like, ah, uh, that could be it. However, on the qualitative side, I did have an opportunity to interview one, one of the leaders who was, uh, you know, in her first year as a principal. Uh, it, some of the quotes she said, I wish I would have pulled this quote, but she said, you know, when I, when I got here, uh, it wasn't like I had 20 teachers. It was like I had 20 administrators. Um, she goes, because everyone's here has been working here for 15 years. It's my first year in leadership. It's my first year at this school, and she kind of qualitatively displayed low efficacy. Uh, and, and, and also, you know, it's her first year and a pandemic hits. So there was this really interesting, I thought, oh, yeah, you, you're, one of, you're one of the people on this side of the chart. But I, I, I did, I tried to run some mean comparisons and, and, and find if I, see if I could target that group and I was not able to really definitively, quantitatively, target that group uh, and say, here's who, here's who the group is that doesn't score a four or a five. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Rivas, anything? In terms of I, don't, I don't have a question, but in that same vein, I find it fascinating about this relationship, burnout, self-efficacy, and the collectivist culture what you found in the Chicanex data is that there's a collectivist culture that has a relationship with all of this. So what I thought was so rich and fascinating from a counseling perspective, it's not a surprise that relationships kind of underpin all of this. And then going back to your the self-efficacy, that perception, our perception of being effective is buffered 
in the relationships we develop and that feedback we get. And that's the rewarding piece, I think, that keeps us from burning out. And that's that thing that you build over time and work hard at that I think gives a sense of having some reward when this kind of stuff happens like a pandemic and it pays off. I wonder what kinds of, um, how that, going back to what Dr. Navarez was saying and that underpinning all of this is relationships. I think there's something in that vein that I'm just very fascinated and curious about. And that's, I think that's why the qualitative data, you found a little bit of that, someone in their first year hadn't built the relationship yet, hasn't had any sense of, am I good at this? Versus someone who put in 15, 20 years and had a sense of, okay, I've been working on relationships. I've had a bit of that coming, um, that reward, I guess. And I feel more competent and confident because that's really that perception is I'm competent and confident at what, what I'm doing and it's working. And you work harder at it and work harder at the relationship. So it's a, it's a kind of a cyclical, cycle you found right I, and I, it's interesting because as you're describing it uh i'm imagining the outputs of the work being relational trust through shared meaning making once that relational trust output exists between staff and leadership it feeds back to efficacy which feeds back into like more relationship and trust strengthening the systems themselves i mean shared leadership is strengthened when you and i have already created some shared meaning before together, and now we have strength in relationship and trust as an input to shared leadership, and our outputs are stronger over time. So there is this cyclical, systematic approach whereby uh, I, I think there's a strengthening that happens over time. Good. Uh, so, so, so John, uh, those were the warm-up questions. And, uh, and, and and don't answer this question the, the way I answered it when a committee member asked to do in my dissertation defense, okay? So kind of don't answer in a way to say, look, this is beyond, good question, but this is beyond the scope of my study. I had that quote written down right here. <laughs> so, so, uh, so are you able to create a, a change model for uh, disrupted change? based on your findings and if and if so how, how would that how would that look like and if you can actually draw it up and map, map it out live right now right here on my hand how do it look like uh, actually you know the framework that is in chapter five although it's kind of ed you or you know academic uh in nature I, i've been really thinking about this um but, but John, John, that's more of a hybrid model based on uh, Lewin's uh, change model, right? If you just kind of just kind of clear your mind from that, and just based on your uh, your own studies findings, what would it, and, and think about it even in Carter's Carter's eight, eight, eight step process, what 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 would those constructs, what would those steps look like? I mean, you know, the whole issue of efficacy, it's got to be infused within this your own model, the, the whole uh, issue of relationship building, right? Those, I, I'm, I, gave, I just gave away two. What are five others? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I do think a systems, uh, a systems approach is really important to this work. I didn't conceptualize that originally, but I think somewhere in this model that you're building systems for these factors to, uh, uh, to operationalize within. You can't just do shared decision-making from your desk in your uh, leadership office. So there has to be some systems construction involved in this work. You have to create a system where leaders and staff come together in shared committees and do shared decision making. You have to create a communications structure that communications are regular, transparent, clear and concise, predictable, uh, 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 and, and available. Like each one of the climate factors requires some systems. So if I'm looking like a Cotter eight step one of my steps is build the systems, the, build the structures for these systems to operationalize within. Um, I, I think that uh, as Cotter does, Cotter recruits specifically uh, coalitions. And I think that the same would be true in this model, uh, Dr. Navarre, that once, this, once the structures are in place, you would use kind of a Cotter-esque uh, uh, concept to build coalitions who would engage in each of these climate f factors. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, 
shared decision making should be should permeate throughout the organization. But if you're just starting that work, you're probably going to curate a, a selective group who are going to be your shared decision making group, and it'll permeate out from there. So as we look through like building um, building structures to facilitate the systematic approach of curating or uh, uh, constructing a, a coalition to operationalize each of these. I definitely think going back to this relationships piece, how do we, how do we play? It's almost, it, this is a very positivist epistemological approach because we're talking about like step by step doing this, but it's really not. This is a social constructivist uh, uh, conversation really. So how, how are we going to, how do you lay out a, a, a social constructivist model in a positivist, you know, uh, 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 framework? Um, so I think relationships have to be in there. How do we place that in there in a way that's meaningful? Um, you know, I, I think you would definitely have to call that piece out. I think that recognizing the outputs of relational trust and somehow feeding them back to the beginning of the model would be important. That we that we would want to coach leaders to be cognizant of outputs of shared meaning and relational trust and utilize those as inputs into the future climate preparation. Mm. That makes sense to you inside my brain. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. No, no, it, it, it does. And it doesn't it doesn't have to be either or. I think it's a little bit of both the socially constructed and the, and the positivist approach, right? They got to go hand in hand. Um, now, it while underscored by context, and I think you talked to, to, to that quite a bit, right? You can't compare apples and oranges in terms of, you know, a school that is 100 versus, you know, 4,500. Right, so so the context uh, and the constructs uh, infused within the context need to need to drive you know the the, the approach uh, in, ter in terms of what approach you take on to facilitate the disruptive change. Right? Yeah, at one point, right, we had contingency theory as one of the theoretical underpinnings of the conceptual framework, and I think it still applies because you're right. I mean, contingency theory indicates that like based on the context, based on the contingent factors. You know, Cantor talks about you need both uh, a positivist and a socially constructivist uh, uh, epistemological approach to all change because sometimes we are going through a planned change model and sometimes we're going through an emergent change model and sometimes they overlap. You start with plan and then cross over to emergent or start with emergent and cross over to planned. And it's really interesting because I feel like that's what we've done this year on two factors. Uh, COVID response to COVID-19 and the emergent demand for uh, response to uh, uh, issues of equity through social justice. So uh, I think that's been a very interesting thing to observe through uh, the lens of Cantor. Good. Uh, moving on to chapters four and five, uh, Dr. Osalek, what, what do you got for four or five? Uh, John, uh, so we, we have the climate concept, which is the, sh uh, um, the organizational members shared perceptions of the, the different characteristics of a work environment, which is different from culture, where this, you got these more underlying meanings. And, um, and then your study looked at uh, um, uh, leaders' um, efficacy around this concept uh, and with some you know, intriguing results and also um, intriguing in the sense that they are all high across the board. But now I'm going to play the devil's advocate. And I know you can answer this question very well because you know the field inside out. If you were to do a, a climate study where you go out and you already started alluding that in, my, in, in your response to my earlier question, that you go out and collect data from the teachers and the staff and you really look at the, those five climate factors uh, at schools. Well, and this is kind of a more hunched type of question. Uh, like, where do you think would the discrepancies be? Like what leaders tell that they're doing and what's happening in the field, and why do you, uh, you feel like those discrepancies might exist? And this is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. So you're telling me uh, six hundred and seven leaders across every institutional and leadership characteristic type, and they're all like efficacy. I got it. Oh, collaborative engagement to produce relational trust. You are singing my. That's me all the way. Then why are things so bad out there, people? Like. I look out the window and people are struggling with managing disruptive change, but everybody I talk to is like, oh, I'm doing it. It's working at my school. So I think a follow-up study is, yeah, let's get staff members and where will the discrepancy be? I think there's a really, again, self-perception is probably not the best perception. We've asked leaders, hey, do you engage in shared decision-making and does that help to prepare climate? And overwhelmingly, 
Yes, that does. If I went to the staff and said, hey, uh, this leader says they are all about shared decision making, they might throw something at me. Like, wait, when did we – wait? because what, what a leader perceives as shared decision making, a staff member would be like, well, they let us uh, you know, make some of the decisions around the fringe, but some of the core decisions were not really ours to be made. We were told we were going to do Zoom in the room during distance learning, and I didn't have any input as the instructional methodologies that were utilized in my school during this COVID shutdown. And the leader says, oh, no, I did share decision making. I asked them if they wanted to use Zoom or Google Meet. You know, and so it's really, I think the discrepancy, I, I love my findings, and I'm in love with my study, and I'm so grateful that I got a chance to do it. But now I realize how much is missing. Dr. Navarro's loves to say, what's missing? Well, what's missing is a whole half of a, the study which says, how does it look on the other side? And I believe wholeheartedly that with, with, with honest intentions, leaders answer this. They answered it honestly. But I think the perspective of those on the other side of these relationships, those voices need to, need to be included somehow. They won't be in this study, but I think in a future study. Does that, did that answer your yeah, question? It does. And that brings me to my next question, which is to me even more fun because I, you are a very insightful person. So, I, so if you would design a model, because you got these qualitative results and you got these quantitative results, and there's a tension between those results, even right? If you ask them quantitatively, yes, I'm also having self-efficacy, but then once you get into the relationship, you get these all sorts of stories that's coming out and screaming and yelling out of the, yelling out of the qualitative data, telling the real story. But there are insights there. I think your, your your dissertation provides, and those tensions also, I think, provides a lot of insights. So now that you got those insights, which you didn't have before you did this study, and I'm going to ask probably, Carlos would agree, this is like almost like the lamest dissertation question, <laughs> but, but I, I think, you know, it makes sense. If you would design this, another study now, and if you start all over again, what would you add in your model that is a, is a key variable, oh, and, and, and what would you take out? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think uh, as I start my second dissertation, thanks for that. I hope you all believe on the committee again. Um, just kidding. This is the only one. Uh, I, I, I really do think that we would consider including, now that we know that relationships are at play, uh, Dr. Rivas probably could have told me that from the beginning from her counseling background, but now that we know relationships are at play, why would we just study one half of the relationship? I think going back and redesigning this study to uh, through the concept that symbolic social interactions are interactive, and why are we only talking to one participant? I think the idea is I would I would reconstruct this model. I might do it as a case study or a multiple case study. Pick three schools, really study the leader, and then study twelve staff members at that school, at that school, in that district, and then. That, that way, rather than getting 600 leaders, really getting down to like a leader and some staff and then, then triangulate the findings there because even if the leader is efficacious and, and even if the staff feel, say, well, like, oh, that leader is not doing as much as they say they are, the, the truth will then be somewhere in the middle. They are doing something and it's having some impact on climate preparation and that would be, that'd be really interesting. Uh, I know I, I'm talking probably more than I should, but no, 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 so thank one, you. one, one, one interesting tension within the data, right, was that qualitative sub-theme that uh, the leader said, unions. Boy, the unions get in the way. Well, qualitatively, that emerged as a sub-theme. It rang as clear as a bell, but then quantitatively, in the multiple regression, didn't, didn't play out at all. So there's this really interesting, like, because I asked, do you have a collective bargaining agreement or not? And I found no uh, significant relationship uh, that determined that it, it reduced uh, uh, climate preparation. So that I think that by itself might be an interesting standalone. Like, well, what do you mean? Why is there so much tension between this data? Excellent, uh, Dr. Juvenato. So, what, what do you have for four five? I have uh, one question actually, right on that same on that same pathway. So you you talk about those that were not statistically significant in your regression, right? Um, and I and I really want to hear about why you think maybe some of them weren't and or were any of them refuted in other findings, say in the qualitative, much like you just mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big standout one for me for sure is that, uh, 
Here you have this really clear qualitative data that say that unions are a barrier, but then this quantitative data indicates that unions don't have a statistically significant relationship in a negative or positive way with that dependent variable. Now, <laughs> so I, know I was, you know, I was kind of coached, don't go on fishing expeditions, don't go into the data and just start looking, but I couldn't help it. There are some interesting, um, so I stuck to the one multiple regression that we built as, as, as part of chapter three. But if you, veer, if you veer off the pathway and start looking at uh, some of these independent variables uh, in different ways or juxtaposed to different dependent variables, kind of asking different questions, there's some really interesting data with, within the findings. Uh, so while, while unions may not have presented as a, um, a barrier to this particular dependent variable uh, or, or gender, did not uh, uh, present, if you flip a different dependent variable in there, you start to find uh, potentially some significant uh, findings. I wish I would have built some slides that I could flip to right now because there were lots of interesting findings um, uh, that were not really on the topic of this dependent variable. Now, why didn't some flush out? I think what's interesting is I took the, the three questions per climate factor, that's 15 questions for, for five climate factors, and I spread them out across the survey, mixed them up because, you know, I don't know, I think I read somewhere that that maybe made, made, made it more, uh, more valid. Uh, and to see all of them valued so high either is a construct of the way I wrote those questions. Maybe it was maybe because I'm a leader. The limitation is my own perspective led those leaders into like, well, of course. I, so there's a limitation there. Like someone else maybe should write these questions and put them out because here's a I'm a, you know, I'm a 22 year educator. I've been, in, so I'm writing these questions and other leaders are reading them saying four and five. So that might be why we found some of what we found. However, what was interesting, uh, and I don't have a great answer, the value for the climate factors did not predict climate engagement, but the use of climate factors, and there was these five questions and they got right to the point. I use mission-aligned communications to prepare a school climate. I use shared decision-making to prepare my school climate for disruptive change. And on those, those had a predictive relationship to what the leaders perceived as climate preparation. Um, so I think it's interesting why one and not the other. Well, because one was just, do you value it? Yes, I do. But do you really engage in it? I think we maybe got, did, maybe we got more truthful answers down here on do I do this? Yes, I do. And that aligned better to the de dependent variable than this, you know, loose, like, oh yeah, I value that. That that seems important to me. But when it gets down to like, do I do it? Then maybe we got more variance in the data. Nice. Theory versus action, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah. Dr. Rivas? I'm kind of curious now just to ask you this. Uh, now that you've done this, you found relationships, you found self-efficacy, you found um, you have a really good model here. Yeah. What does that mean about how we would train someone coming in new? Because uh, now that there's a cycle you've identified yeah. Yeah. and time plays a role, yeah. building relationship plays a role, self-efficacy is built in that cycle. And we know that every time a leadership change happens, there's like a rebuilding. So what do you think about the future yeah. now with this data in mind? A couple of things you touched on. Uh, one of them, I'll take the last one first, the first or the second, but uh, there's leadership turnover. I believe that when you take a systematic approach to building shared decision-making, mission-aligned communications, uh, you know, you build these into the structures of your school. Every third Wednesday, we're going to get in our shared decision-making teams. Every second Friday, we're going to do the the communications blast is going to come out very transparently. Once you start building these things as a leader, you've built a system for preparing climate. And what have you done? You've prepared that school for your own succession. When you leave, that's the thing about, and it came out in the study, but like transformative or transformational and transformative leaders are critical to managing change. But when they leave, what happens, right? Organizations fall apart and restart. But if you build systems, when you leave, those systems remain behind. And so uh, I think there's something here that, uh, that, that if you do a good job as a leader, you've, you've prepared the school for your own dismissal, right? And I love that idea. 
Um, don't don't dismiss me. My board president's is watching. Don't dismiss me. Um, I'm not done. Um, so how would I prepare future leaders for this? I I you know I don't know that I've got the Sure, I do. I would like to write a book. I think that there's a book in here. I think that there's a podcast series in here. I think that there's a way to explain this to people where they go, oh, that makes sense. Now, I've recently now had contact with 607 leaders. Uh, many of them uh, have signed up to be a part of a mailing that I'm going to mail out a uh, executive summary from this study. And I think I can follow up with those leaders and go, hey, um, you indicated that you do shared decision making. Could you, could I? Could I interview you just around that topic? And I think we could curate from across the state some best practices on how we actually create these systems in real organizations and highlight those in a text that then can be utilized in higher education and um, leader preparation programs that says, oh, this makes sense. It's, it's about relationships, trust, and time. Page one, start building systems. Oh, those systems help with relationships, trust, and work over long periods of time. So... I think that's how I see that going. That's brilliant. And I wonder if part of that entrance cycle and exit cycle is like a mentoring process yeah. and a succession planning process that uh, may have to be included in that cycle. I love that idea. Yes. Yes. Let me write that down. Just a second. Uh, so I'm recording this. I've got this on my court. And now we're getting it to discuss critical reflection, analytical reflection, critical commentary in your chapter five, right? It, exactly, you know, posing those critical questions based on your on your findings. And and look, we're as a committee, we're giving you the green light to engage in critical questions and commentary uh, because your findings uh, provide you with as a springboard. They provide you as a springboard to engage in critical discussion, right? So. You know, along those lines in the recommendations, John, I would say that you uh, that you go back and make sure that your recommendations are, are directly based on your key findings, right? Because right now it's kind of hit and miss. Some is based on the literature and what have you. They need to be, it's, it's all about alignment, right? Alignment from the purpose statement, literature review, findings, analysis, um, and conclusions or what have you, right? So, so be deliberate in, in doing just that. And I and, and you're well versed. Like for let, let me actually ask you, what was your key finding for a research question two? I know there was multiple findings, but give us one. Uh, the, the climate factors work uh, systematically and uh, strengthen with uh, inputs of relationships and trust, producing outputs of uh, relational trust through shared meaning making. Wow. This guy is ready to profess as a professor. That that is very impressive. Wow. Okay. So turn that into a recommendation. Okay. No, no. I'm actually I'm actually asking you to do it now, John. Oh, but I was writing it down. That was your fault. You you picked yeah, one that my is fault. my fault. Uh, yeah, so. Yes. So um, uh, the recommendation for policy based, based on that major finding. Yeah. Turn it into a recommendation. Yeah. Right? Uh, based on the major finding from uh, research question two, it's recommended that the California standards for profession, uh, the California professional standards for educational leadership, reconceptualize climate preparation, including uh, the five climate factors as a systematic approach that strengthens uh, when relationships and trust are utilized as inputs, recognizing relational trust as an output through the shared meaning making, uh, which presents as a prepared school climate. There you go. There you go. So, so go back to all your major findings based on the research questions, and then use that once again as a springboard to make those major recommendations. Okay. Yeah. No, I like the discussion about you're talking about institutional change, and I know Dr. Oselek, he's in management, business, what have you. We understand it takes you know five, six years to to engage in institutional uh, change, right? If you will. Um, at the same time, what, what is the, the, the years of tenure for a principal? What is it, five, six years? So, so, no, so no, noting, noting that you're not good, for the most part, you're not going to be there to realize you know, the whole change process. So understanding that, it's important that you build the leadership capacity of others. So when you leave, because not if, but when, and it's sooner rather than later, you're going to be off, right? So this takes an altruistic approach where you're doing it for the betterment of, 
the institution, the organization, the school that you're part of, right? Yeah. Okay. Knowing that you're not going to be there, but it's it's you know it, the 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 school is not going to go to shambles, or they're going to be uh, chicken without a head. They're going to be continue to move forward in in changing that that climate or disruptive change in, in in your case. So that's the kind of critical discussion that we want you to engage in that chapter five, right? As you uh, as you discuss conclusions, recommend, uh, discussions and recommendations, suggestions for future res research, coupled with talking to that infuse, once again, critical commentary, right? Very good. We want to hear your voice. Prior to this, you, you've been telling us about everybody else's voice, the researchers, the theorists, the participants. This is your, your, your time to, to shine, right? And Carlos, I, I want to chip in there because I think you really uh, raise a very important point in that, like the, 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 the span of time for a leader and the span of time for institutional change and, and how little as human beings we are as compared to the institutions. And maybe for your is because this is something that I and some of my collaborators have been really putting our minds together these days. Uh, and if I may, I might just recommend that one thing that we have been thinking about is um, documenting also what you have done in the organization, like write about it, talk about it, record it, create policies around it, create some stories around it so that even when you leave, uh, the, the legend is stayed there. It's, it's still there. It's written, it's spoken, it's remembered. Otherwise, uh, um, if, if changes just dissipate when their leaders go, then we always have this, you know, reinventing the wheel processes for organizations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great point, great point. Uh, Clark, right? Clark, Clark's sagas, which lead to institutional culture, right? Creating those narratives about change, creating those stories that we all hold on to when the leader leaves, but we have those sagas or stories that guide us afterwards. Yeah, great, great point. So, 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 so John, once again, another example in terms of engaging in critical commentary is your finding in terms of the finding and differences between uh, uh, white and non-white particip participants, particularly you know Latinx uh, 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 subjects that, that you that you interview, right? And and see here, why why do you think that is in terms of why they're advocating more for self-efficacy or for just the whole climate factors across uh, preparation for, for climate? Could it be? And this is an example in terms of how you can get into discussion. Could it be that? Based on the experience, any of you as supported or, or heard uh, as compared to, you know, to, uh, you know, to white individuals and therefore they can relate and share now that they're the advocates. So that's a kind of, you know, critical commentary that, you know, uh, uh, pose propositions, right? Pose critical questions, right? Engage in analytical. We want to just hear your voice here based on findings. Yeah, very good. Okay, uh, what, what comes next, and, and anything else from the committee before we allow maybe a questions for the participants? We're good? Okay. Um, this is your time uh, to, to ask one, one or two questions. That, that's the, the time we have left here. Anyone in terms of participants? Um, I have a question about, um, let me, I wrote this down a while ago. Yes, I was wondering when you're trying to um, track down the people with the low efficacy, I was wondering um, if you had thought about maybe going after problems solved rather than years in office, looking at um, had they dealt with critical change in the past or not, maybe in your uh, qualitative interviews, if um, like high efficacy people noted that they dealt with this issue, solved it, and no matter where they move, they, they have this training or interaction to build these relationships quicker. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. great question, right? Uh, in the Obviously, I didn't have an opportunity to kind of look at the quantitative data from that perspective. Although uh, Dr. Oselic and I did create this composite for engagement in social justice, um, and I did not run a regression model that says uh, when people, because it did, the, the, the engagement in social justice uh, response uh, from the summer of 2020 didn't pan out as a uh, statistically significant uh, relationship with the dependent variable. Uh, but we also used it qualitatively, uh, which is a very interesting, but I did not do a cross-tab analysis of those who engaged were those the people who were also more efficacious. So I think that was the only, the only uh, 
challenge met that I could have used as a factor. But I love the way you're thinking about that uh, because it would be interesting to find commonalities. Those who overcame this, is that why they feel more efficacious? But going back to what Dr. Oselic had mentioned is that, uh, you know, administrators in the state of California have to serve as teachers for two years. So you kind of got this baseline. And then the data includes vice principals up to superintendents. And you find some really interesting data around efficacy it turns out that everyone's boss feels more efficacious than them. Uh, so that was an interesting. That was an interesting study. The people farthest from the children are most efficacious about how to lead. I'm like, oh, it was really. Good. So I wonder, Dustin, if there's a piece in there as well. You know, those who have climbed up to this next level feel more efficacious for doing this work that they're actually farther away from doing now. I would say mm -hmm. the vice principal and the principal are closest to doing the work uh, and the least efficacious on the model when you include associate superintendents, deputy directors, you know, and, and the superintendents. So, yeah, to get at that, Dustin, I, I think maybe there's – I didn't get specific on what challenges they had overcome, but certainly the climbing of the ladder uh, was something that seemed to produce uh, a little more uh, feelings of uh, efficacy. Now, I didn't include a lot of the data uh, in a presentation, partly because it was so tight. I mean, it was like a tenth of a, it. Was, it was the, because there wasn't as much variance in the data. I wish I would have got a better histogram because, or a better, you know, better spread. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, you know, it was a 0 0.01 or 0 0.04 uh, difference. But yeah, good question. Thank you. I hope that answers that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, anyone? Hi, yes, uh, this is Gabby. Hi, John. Hello, Gabo. <laughs> uh, I just have a question about what you came across as far as strategy and planning. Like every every organization has a strategic plan that they invest a lot into. Did these just get checked out the window when there was disruptive change, or did that provide any continuity? Yeah, really interesting. So that that the closest I would get to that, uh, Gabo, is that um, the mission aligned communications conversation really held tight to like, are you communicating through the mission that's already been established, right? Uh, when you go out and build communications, are you using the mission as part of that? And uh, the big sub theme that came out of that, Gabby, was uh, leader said, you've got to explain the why. Why are we making this change? Why did we decide to go with Zoom in the room as opposed to this other instructional model? Why did we decide to go to four days a week instead of two days a week? Why, why did we make... So answering the why, uh, overwhelmingly leaders came back and said, hey, it, it, we tried to stick to the mission on that. However, I would say there's a whole study just around that, uh, that particular uh, uh, um, conversation of... of how tight to the mission did you stay? Uh, it didn't come out so much in the narratives, Gabby, but it did come out in the interviews. So uh, speaking with leaders, they did speak to staying connected to that mission and that mission uh, explain, you know, being the backboard of why we're making this change. So I don't know that strategic plans got thrown out the window. A lot of work got put on hold. I heard that. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, talking about that, that work around social justice was also interesting uh, because I had the opportunity to say, hey, I understand you responded to COVID-19. We all did. State of California closed down uh, and we all had to follow the governor's uh, executive order. But, you know, there was quite a demand for social justice after uh, the summer of 2020. Was your organization able to uh, uh, engage in that work? And I was actually pleasantly surprised by how many leaders said, absolutely, I took this moment to execute on something that I've been wanting to do. One uh, African-American principal, a uh, wonderful leader, uh, articulated, you know, I waited and other boards were saying things and, and, I, and, I, and I thought my board was gonna say something and they didn't. And so I wrote up, so, so he took action. Uh, and I, want, I don't wanna describe his actions because I wanna anonymize his data, but, um, but uh, he took some action and I thought, Yes, that was a fascinating conversation, uh, which was juxtaposed to another leader who was a uh, white male leader in a rural uh, community. And he said, John, you know, if I would have done something about social justice, I'd have lost my job. My board didn't want me talking about that. 
I was like, yeah, so that, so it was interesting, Gabul. I think people do stick somewhat with their strategic planned action. Are we going to respond to social justice? Well, not in that rural county where it doesn't fit into the agenda. And are, am I going to respond to social justice? This principal may have gone off script a little bit, but then his, his superintendent actually followed him, which was, I thought was a great story. It was like, oh, you're, you're doing something? We're behind you 100%. Nice. Good. Well, this concludes uh, this part of uh, dissertation defense. Now we're, we get a chance to go into, the committee goes into a breakout room for about five minutes, and then we'll reconvene with the greater group and provide a, our verdict.